This week on today's Air Force, we're headed down south, way down south, to the South Pole to see how the Air Force supports scientific research in Antarctica. Hello and welcome to a special edition of today's Air Force. I'm Staff Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz. This week we're headed to the bottom of the globe for an inside look at Operation Deep Freeze. It's an Air Force led operation that supports scientific research in Antarctica. Back in 1902, British Navy Captain Robert Scott boarded a tethered balloon and became the first person to fly over Antarctica. More than a century later, Air Force C-17s and LC-130s fly through those frigid skies, providing logistical support to scientists on the continent. Antarctica is not an easy place to visit, and Master Sergeant Lee Hoover had to travel more than 8,000 miles to get there from his home station of McGee Tyson Air National Guard Base in Tennessee. He came back with a detailed account of how the Air Force makes sure scientists in Antarctica have the food and equipment they need to survive. Antarctica is the most isolated continent on Earth. It is the only continent without a permanent human population, and few have ever traveled far enough south to see its beauty. It's a land where penguins go swimming in the local waters, or sledding on the local ice, as long as the seals don't get there first. It's also a land that has been dedicated to science for more than 50 years. You can't understand the whole planet without an understanding Antarctica. And that would be true whether there was ice on this continent or not. But of course, in addition to uh, the fact that it's one of uh, the six major continental masses, there is the environment that exists here now and has existed for over 30 million years. So it is a unique laboratory for understanding the environment in, in which we live. Everything done in Antarctica is related to science. More than 20 nations have conducted scientific research on the continent, with scientists studying everything from geology, biology, physics, and more. The National Science Foundation is the lead agency for the United States Antarctic program and has been managing scientific research on the continent since the late 1950s. What we're doing down there is, is, is amazing science and uh, and I personally believe that a lot of that science will be applicable to the health and benefit of this world in the long run. And, and the more we know, the better we are able to take care of it and protect it. Today, the United States Antarctic Program runs three year-round research stations, including the recently built Edmundson Scott South Pole Station. They also open up numerous field camps during the summer months when the weather is mild enough for human activity. Ian DL is one of the many scientists that have made their way to Antarctica and has been coming to the continent for over 40 years to study geology. He has spent much of his time in these field camps, which are located literally in the middle of nowhere. Those of us who do that, they're probably crazy, but we, we tend to love it. Um, when you get into the middle of the continent, uh, a lot of the work that I've done, I've done from camps with four or six people, uh, just in two or three Scott tents. And uh, we go out there and because it's a dry cold, you can be extremely comfortable living in a tent, as long as you can stay out of the wind. The wind's the, you know, figurative and literal killer. That's, that's what makes, makes or breaks a day out, out on, the, on the outcrop during geology, is how strong is the wind. If the wind's blowing strongly, you know, 20 knots and above, it's a miserable day. Let's not kid ourselves. The question I had is how do these scientists survive? How do they get their food, their equipment, and supplies? The answer is Operation Deep Freeze, the Air Force-led joint operation that has been providing support to the American scientists since 1955. Our sole mission is to give unique logistic support to the National Science Foundation. Things that they can't contract through any other uh, method, they'll have the Department of Defense do. This is the story I wanted to tell. I wanted to see firsthand how the Joint Task Force Support Forces Antarctica brings different elements of the military together to support these scientists. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. It's a total force and a joint team. We have Guard, Reserve, Active. We have sailors, Army, Airmen, Marines. Uh, we have everything that participates. I wanted to talk to the Airmen who have been doing this mission for years. This is my 14th season. This is my second season. Five years now. 20 years. 
just got started in uh, 2005. Uh, it's my 15th season. It's the story that took me from my home in Knoxville, Tennessee to Atlanta, Georgia, from Atlanta to Los Angeles, and Los Angeles all the way to Christchurch, New Zealand. In Christchurch, I met Marlene. I actually process all the people that go to Antarctica in regards to their clothing requirements, etc. It's nearly impossible to survive in Antarctica without cold weather gear, and Marlene and her co-workers ensure those who head south have everything they need, from the heavy-duty pants, boots, wool hats, and more. The most important is that lovely warm parka, which is filled with grease down. And then, depending on people's job, their issues actually decided on their job description, the station they'll be at, and what season they're going to be doing, of course. Marlene says this job allows her to make a difference and help others reach their goals. It's a satisfaction that is only amplified by meeting and working with people from all parts of life. The people are just amazing, and I honestly say probably no two days here are ever the same. Sure, there's core tasks, but yes, it's interesting. It's kind of like a great big family. After I met Marlene, it was time to stand in line and out process for the flight to Antarctica. Nearly all aerial resupply in and out of Antarctica is accomplished with a C-17 Glowmaster III aircraft deployed to Christchurch, New Zealand from Air Force Reserve Units at Joint Base Lewis-McChord in Washington State. Every Operation Deep Freeze season, the C-17 flies over 60 missions, transporting loads of cargo and passengers in and out of McMurdo Station in Antarctica. It's a national asset. Its capability uh, to operate on and off of those uh, of the ice runway uh, in the middle of the Antarctic and, and you know McMurdo and, and bring a huge amount of cargo in is uh, it's a tr it's a credit to that airplane and those air crews that fly it because it really does um, it, it's it's the best air resupply possible into that area. Airmen work with members of the New Zealand Royal Air Force to load the necessary cargo and passengers aboard the aircraft before taking off on the five-hour flight over the lower Atlantic, across the Ross Sea, and into Antarctica. It's a challenging flight that requires specialized airmen who have years of training and retraining to ensure mission success. It's a special qualification for the C-17 guys, so they select the people they want to do the program that they can retain and uh, develop in the program. They're safety-minded, uh, good aviators, good maintainers. They can come down here and work um, it, in Christchurch to undo the mission, keep the plane going with very little support. On my flight, I quickly learned an important lesson when traveling this far south, a lesson those who have worked in this area year after year know very well. Clocks and calendars do not determine travel itineraries here. The weather does. This is probably the most uh, dangerous uh, peacetime mission that we do, just that the weather um, changes rapidly down in Antarctica. The ice cold and unpredictable weather is the biggest concern during these flights, and it completely affects the mission. The crew takes a number of precautions to ensure the aircraft is serviceable in the conditions, but there is one element the aircrew has no control over. That is the lack of places to land. There is nothing between Christchurch and McMurdo Station, so once the aircraft takes off, it has to land in Antarctica or turn around and go back to Christchurch. This means the crew has to have constant updates on the weather. Uh, right now the ceiling is right where we need it to be to land. If it gets any worse when it's at, then we have to turn our back around because it's part of our rules and regulations. On each flight, the air crew predetermines a point of safe return. Once they hit this point, they have to make a decision, turn around or press forward. On our flight south, the weather was perfect for landing when we took off, but in four hours it had changed. So less than a half hour from McMurdo, the crew had to turn around. Based on our uh, PSR weather, it was below our required ceiling, which is 1,503, and the weather forecast is called a 500, and three, so it was well below, that was below what we needed. So it's an automatic turnaround boomerang for us. 
So you're coordinating with Max Center, get us through your altitude, and uh, we're just going back to Christchurch. So all the cargo and all the passengers were brought back to Christchurch to wait for the next flight. Then they reloaded, took off, and tried again. This time, the weather cooperated, and the C-17 landed at McMurdo to deliver the goods. Coming up, we'll travel to the South Pole and see how the Air National Guard provides critical support to the scientists who call this place home. This is Titan 1-4. No signs of life. Titan 1-4, hold your position. What do you got? Unmanned aircraft is identifying enemy sniper. Copy that. Let's move. Thanks, Reaper 1-1. We got it from here. Sensors coming off target. Learn more at Air Force.